Uh, we're going to talk about uh, FLT3 inhibitors in AML. It does represent a per attempt at personalized medicine in a fairly rare disease, which you'll see is a bit daunting in the drug development uh, space. I'll talk about the background. Uh, FLT3 inhibitors as single agents with chemo, and then a little bit about the future. So uh, the genome of AML patients is not really as complicated as the genome uh, in terms of mutations that we see in solid tumors. There's about 23 recurrently mutated genes. Those are genes that are mutated more than 5% of AML cases. Probably the average number of mutations in an AML case is about five. Several of these might be driver mutations. And uh, the Genome Atlas uh, paper that was published three years ago in, the, in New England Journal of Medicine broke down the 23 recurrently mutated genes into nine categories, each of which in greater or lesser degree could be thought of as a target for drug development. But the easiest one, if you will, if that's the right word, are signaling genes, which are generally gain-of-function genes, uh, like you heard about with RAS from Dr. Corcoran, uh, where if we can inhibit them with a small molecule, maybe we can make some impact on the disease. And that, of course, is the nature of my talk. But I don't want to forget about some of these other things. Targeting transcription factors has been a little bit more complicated, but not impossible. Uh, the one on the bottom, spliceosome complex genes, we're beginning uh, one of the first trials of a spliceosome inhibitor uh, now at the Harvard Cancer Center, so we're pretty excited about that. But I will talk about signaling mainly, but just to remind you that um, even though a cancer AML cell might have a FLT3 mutation, uh, we can't assume that that's going to automatically be a home run. When uh, we heard about the fact that FLT3 was mutated in about 30% of AML, and it was a tyrosine kinase mutation, and we hoped that we would be able to inhibit that and have the same kind of success we had in chronic phase CML with imatinib and other related agents. Of course, that was highly naive because what we didn't know then but could have guessed is that uh, the genetic complexity of AML is a lot more than what we've seen in chronic phase CML. There's a lot of other mutations, as I already mentioned. Many of those persist at the time that chemotherapy induces a remission, implying that there's some root mutation or founder mutation that might be present that is not, you can't deal with with chemotherapy, maybe with a stem cell transplant. Some of the mutations I've mentioned are uh, in that category listed there, DNMT3, TP53, TET2, SXL1, EZH2 are among those. IDH uh, is interesting. I'm not going to talk about that today, but that is another very fertile target because it's a gain-of-function mutation that causes uh, uh, production of a different substrate, different reaction product that you get with native IDH. And that can be a, uh, the reaction product to hydroxyglutarate could be uh, followed in terms of uh, a biomarker for the uh, disease burden. Dr. Fati here at the MGH has done a lot of work in that. Uh, also inhibiting that enzyme uh, undoes the uh, effect on the epigenome that the 2-hydroxyglutarate uh, produces and may have some therapeutic benefit. I've seen some amazing responses with IDH inhibitors, so I don't want to forget about that, but most of my talk is going to be about FLT3 inhibitors. Uh, and FLT3 inhibitors are, FLT3 uh, mutations are really a late hit in AML. They're present in, uh, they're not the founder mutation. So it would be, uh, again, like I said, naive to think that inhibiting that would, as a single agent, would, would be able to make a major impact on the disease. It might decrease the disease burden for a while or a significant amount, but it's not going to cure the disease. Uh, and there are obviously a lot of resistance mechanisms. So let's talk about FLT3. FLT3, which I've been alluding to, is a transmembrane tyrosine kinase. Uh, and its overexpression in AML is common. It's important in hematopoiesis generally, and it's required for normal blood cell formation, the wild-type version. Um, but it turns out that mutations of this uh, kinase are common in AML. About 30% of people, or maybe 35% of people with AML, have a mutation. About three-quarters of the mutations are juxtamembrane mutations just inside the cell membrane. Um, well, hitting, oh, there we go just inside the cell membrane there, and it's a, the mutations are a length mutation, a duplication of between several and 100 amino acids um, there, which cause spontaneous dimerization and abrogate the usual requirement for activation based on ligand binding. And similarly, about a quarter of the mutations, or about 5 to 10% of AML overall, are in are point mutations in the tyrosine kinase domain, which similarly cause spontaneous dimerization and abrogation of the need for ligand binding. So the mutation, the overexpression was first described by Japanese investigators in around 1990. Shortly thereafter, people found that there were these activating mutations. And it wasn't until the late 90s and early 2000s 
that Jim Griffin, uh, Don Small, and Johns Hopkins, and others realized that if you transfected uh, fairly indolent uh, hematopoietic cells with either of these two constructs, uh, the cells became transformed and could grow without requiring growth factors. Uh, Gill Lynn showed that if you put one of these two types of mutations into the stem cell of a, of a mouse, the mouse uh, got a myeloproliferative disorder, not quite with all the features of acute leukemia, but enough to kill the mouse uh, without the same degree of uh, immature cell uh, histology. And then people said, well, what how do people with mutant FLT3 AML do? And the most common of the two mutations, the ITD, clearly carries an adverse prognosis. If you look at these two curves here, in standard risk AML, those who have the mutation have a very high relapse rate. Those who don't have the mutation with the same chromosomes, which is largely normal in this picture, uh, have a lower relapse rate. So it clearly is a bad actor, gain of function, so it seemed like a good idea to uh, inhibit. Later on, people said, well, that's, you know, obviously the AML genome, as I already mentioned, is more complex than just yes or no on one cer certain mutation. So this is work done by uh, Ross Levine and others based on a big clinical trial done by ECOG. But the point here is that uh, the company that FLT3 keeps can influence the prognosis. And if, in fact, the company is one of those genes like TET2 or DMT3A that is one of those sort of root mutations, people do really poorly. And if they have a favorable mutation, which is a transcription factor called CBP alpha, they do a little bit better. But as you can see, even in this curve, uh, in this uh, trial that was represented standard treatment of uh, with three and Donna Rubis and Cytarabine and post remission therapy, people with a FLT3 mutation didn't do all that well. And not only the, the type of mutation is important, whether it's a point mutation, which doesn't have the same adverse prognosis uh, as the uh, length mutation does, the degree of mutation burden is important. To wit, if you have a lot of the uh, mutant allele compared to um, a, a small amount of the mutant allele, so these are people with a lot of mutant allele over here, they have a lower CR rate, a very poor median survival, and it is better if you have a lower uh, burden of the mutant allele. So the more, which just sort of says that, well, the more your uh, leukemia cell is dependent upon FLT3 for signaling, the worse the outcome is. Presumptively, these these folks over here may have uh, these folks over here may not be that dependent on uh, the FLT3 to cause their leukemia, but uh, it's worth thinking about when you talk about FLT3 inhibitors. We'll come back to that. So once this gain of function mutation was recognized to be fairly common in AML, and once it was recognized that the ITD subtype of that gain of function mutation was uh, a bad actor in terms of prognosis, uh, obviously the race was on to develop inhibitors of that kinase just as uh, to see if we could be as somewhat as successful as we were with CML and imatinib. So there were a host of enzymes that were, a host of small molecules that inhibit this enzyme that were developed. And there are a number of differences in these uh, inhibitors that are worth mentioning because it may be a paradigm for drug development and other situations where you want to inhibit an activated kinase. In cell-free medium, the available agents that I'm showing here, for examples, were all very potent. But you can see here the IC50 and plasma were vastly different. For example, mitostorin, of which I'll talk about the most uh, now, is highly protein-bound, and you need a lot of it uh, in the plasma to uh, inhibit the enzyme. Fortunately, uh, these are, it's very easy to achieve that uh, safely in patients. The other thing is, so potency, protein binding, and then the specificity of the inhibition is important. These are dendigrams, which I'm sure you're familiar with. The more red, the less specific the enzyme inhibitor is. The less red, the more specific it is. So these two on the left, listortinib and mitostorin, are non-specific. They inhibit a lot of tyrosine, other tyrosine kinases and other kinases as well that aren't tyrosine kinases, whereas this one here, crisartinib, is more specific for FLT3, but not solely for FLT3. That could be good or bad, right? The more enzymes you inhibit, the maybe the worse the toxicity. Maybe you're not really hitting the target, although maybe it's good to be less specific because... Perhaps you're inhibiting other enzymes that might be important in the pathophysiology of that cancer, or in this case, specifically leukemia. So I was uh, most closely associated with mitostorin. Uh, mitostorin's history is interesting. Uh, Novartis owns it. Uh, and they developed it as a protein kinase C inhibitor. I actually worked on pro protein kinase C early in my career in Don Keefe's lab. And that's probably important in the 
physiology of uh, cancers too. And so since this was a protein kinase 412, uh, it was used in solid tumors in a phase one trial. It didn't work, but it could be given uh, safely at a dose that led to a reasonable uh, plasma level. Uh, shortly after the phase one trial was completed, was done by these guys in the UK, uh, Dr. Griffin got a hold of it and realized it was also a FLT3 inhibitor of both subtypes. And this drug specifically inhibited the growth of leukemic cell lines that were made factor independent by one of these two constructs. So that, that was work done by Ellen Weisberger, still works in Jim's lab. And uh, Louise Kelly, who worked in Gary Gilliland's lab, fed this stuff to mice who had this murine uh, myeloproliferative disorder that killed the mice. And when they got, ate some of this stuff, they didn't die as frequently. So it had pretty good preclinical efficacy. Um, and so we, in conjunction with Memorial Sloan Kettering and MD Anderson, did a proof of concept trial many years ago. So again, nine, uh, 1990, definition of the mutation and overexpression, 2000, those preclinical experiments. A few years later, we did the first clinical experiment where we gave the drug to people, 20 patients who had a FLT3 mutation of either subtype. And a lot of the patients had dramatic reductions in their peripheral blasts, but there was only one complete remission. It wasn't even a complete remission in the true sense of the word because the patient's uh, counts didn't recover. Uh, but as I said, a lot of people had a blast reduction. So again, suggesting it was sort of a late hit. We were getting the tumor burden to go down, but we weren't really affecting the disease natural history. And disappointingly, we realized at this moment that it was never going to be uh, approved or useful as a single agent, but it did have biological activity, maybe to the same degree as some of the a matinib does in CML and blast crisis, if you want to look at the glasses being half full. We went on to look at other doses in a wide variety of advanced patients with AML, uh, including 35 patients at different doses than we started with who had a mutation. Again, very few real remissions in the IWG sense of the word, but um, many people had a reduction in their blast count. And even in, and this is important to remember, even in FLT3 wild type patients, there was a response rate, albeit, again, no complete remissions or even partial remissions. Partial remission in leukemia is when you reduce the leukemia burden down significantly and you have a, a normal hematopoiesis as well. Um, so, uh, but it was more, more active in the mutant uh, case, which we expected. Generally well tolerated, some nausea and vomiting, maybe some hematological toxicity, but very, very minimal. Now, that wasn't the only single agent that was tested in, in AML. Uh, again, this was the more specific inhibitor. And this was said to be uh, a more active agent. This was the more potent and specific inhibitor, crizartinib. And the remission rate was 53%, but very few complete remissions again. Most of these people were, uh, had what's called a CRP or a CRI, where they got their, uh, and a partial response is not the two, true IWG partial response here. These just people had a blast reduction. So there was something going on, but it wasn't very, very profound. But I'll come back to tell you that they're trying to get this approved as a single agent in AML. I'll tell you how that's being done in a second. But even in this specific, even this allegedly specific inhibitor, there were still some responses in the people who did not have the mutation. So again, is it really personalized medicine? No, but it's sort of more effective in the ones that you hoped it would be more effective in because their leukemia, at least in some cases, might be driven by the uh, mutation. Uh, another single agent that's uh, more specific and also hits both the tyrosine kinase domain mutation and the uh, point and the ITD. I should point out that this guy here um, is so specific it doesn't even hit the tyrosine kinase domain point mutation. And many of the patients who uh, become resistant to quizartinib do so with an outgrowth of a point mutation. So this one just this one just hits the ITD. This other new one called gilteritinib hits both the FLT3 ITD mutation and the FLT3 TKD mutation. Um, so uh, we'll hear more from that one. Again, the response rate's in the 50% range for the ITD and about the 25% range for the uh, point mutation. Uh, there are some responses in people who've seen prior tyrosine kinase inhibitors. There is a drug called serafinib, which I'll come back to, which is available, obviously, to treat kidney cancer and liver cancer, which is a FLT3 inhibitor as well, and that's why some of these patients got a hold of a FLT3 inhibitor before they were enrolled on this trial with this investigational drug. Quinolinib is a yet another FLT3 inhibitor uh, that hits both the TKD and the point mutation. You can see in this waterfall plot, many of the patients with both types of mutations, some, some of them had dual mutations, responded with a reduction in the peripheral blasts. Um, 
and uh, even some who had seen prior uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors had some responses, although responses were a little bit higher in those who had never seen a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So we have mitostorin single agent data, quizartinib single agent data, and uh, crinolidib single agent data, which is somewhat encouraging. Uh, I did not feel the data was sufficient to get these things approved as a single agent, uh, but <clears throat> the drug companies that made quizartinib and gilteritinib feel differently. Um, there are two important ongoing trials, both of which uh, are, have been open and or will be open uh, sequentially at the, at the Harvard Cancer Center. Um, one of the first one is that quizartinib versus dealer's choice chemo. So these are people with advanced foot 3 relap relapsed AML, maybe not the best place to try a new drug to show a survival benefit, but that's what's being done. To go on this trial, you have to have uh, an ITD mutation, not a point mutation, because this one doesn't hit that subtype. And you have to have less than six months disease for interval, looking for the really bad patients who have a very short disease for interval. That's the most important prognostic sign in relapsed AML, how long you were in remission the first time. So that's one trial. Uh, this was open for a while, and we're closing that to put people on this trial, which is gilteritinib, which is that specific one that inhibits both the ITD and the TKD. This is a little bit more relaxed. Uh, you, have to, you, you can have a longer disease for interval, and it's for both um, FLT3 and TKD relapsed AML. The trial design in both these cases is interesting. You either get your, it's a two to one randomization, I think. Two, that means two thirds of the people get the study drug, and one third get randomized to a pre selected chemotherapy regimen, which could be high dose chemo like, three, uh, like FLAG IDA, which is a very intensive regimen, or low dose chemo with something like decitabine which is a hypomethylating agent. Um, but certainly um, combining these things with chemotherapy might be a good idea. Uh, suppose you want to uh, do, do the combination of a FLT3 inhibitor with chemotherapy in the relapse setting. So everything I've shown you so far is in relapsed AML. That's when we test new drugs. It's a tough situation to test a new drug because the patients are sick. They have... Uh, uh, usually their disease is addicted, more addicted to one drug, so that might be one, ends, uh, one mutation, so that might be a good thing. But they've also seen a lot of chemo. They tend to be resistant. They have a lot of other mutations, as I mentioned as well. Anyway, uh, Mark Levis, who's a very smart uh, researcher in this field at Johns Hopkins, uh, did a trial in relapsed AML, but just relapsed patients who had a FLT3 ITD mutation. So this was a genetically selected group of relapsed patients and they were uh, randomized to get standard chemotherapy, which this is a three-drug regimen or high-dose ARC. The choice was based on how long the disease for interval was. Anyway, they got the standard chemo that we get for relapsed AML or that plus lestortinib at 80 milligrams twice a day. So uh, Mark was fairly optimistic when he started this trial because he said, well, relapsed patients are, FLT3 is important because it's a late hit and they're addicted to it. We can inhibit it and maybe make some difference in the outcome. Unfortunately, the complete remission rate, which is sort of how we test drugs in AML, uh, do patients clear their blast within a month or two of therapy, and the complete remission rate was the same in both arms, about 12 or 15 percent. If you add in the people who had reduction in blast but lack of platelet recovery, you, you still got no improvement with the addition of uh, listortinib, and uh, there were no subgroups that seemed to benefit. Uh, and the survival in the two groups uh, was dismal, as you'd expect for relapse AML, less than three quarters of a year, and there wasn't really no long-term survivors. One problem with this is that many of the patients who were on the listortinib arm didn't have sufficient plasma levels of listortinib to inhibit the enzyme. Uh, Mark did a retrospective post hoc analysis looking at just those people who had adequate drug levels in the blood, and those people may have benefited somewhat from the listortinib. So uh, this was thrown out, but uh, it, it may have been thrown out for a reason that just the drug wasn't getting uh, sufficiently enough levels in the blood. That hasn't stopped other companies from pursuing the same idea in relapsed AML. This is an ongoing trial with a new generation uh, inhibitor that again hits both the ITD and the TKD. This is crinolinib. Uh, this is a, a drug combination, mitosantrin and cytarabine, which we don't really use that commonly in relapsed AML around here, but it's that drug combination plus placebo or crinolinib and then, of course, if you haven't already had an allo transplant by the time you be, before you relapsed, you then are supposed to be going on to allo transplant, followed by use of this drug in the post-transplant setting. So there are trials in relapsed AML. Uh, 
Uh, there, there's also trials in, uh, with another drug, serafinib. As already mentioned, serafinib is a little bit more readily available because it's already approved, albeit for a different cancer or cancers, uh, liver cancer and mainly renal cancer. Uh, that was combined with chemotherapy uh, by Dr. Avandi at MD Anderson, and the complete remission rate was pretty high in a small trial, but looking at the long-term outcome, it didn't seem to be all that much better than what one would have expected from historical controls. Um, Eben Chen uh, here at MGH and colleagues at the Farber uh, recognized this might be a useful agent in the post-transplant setting where A, disease burden might be a little less, and B, um, maybe serafinib would alter the immunological milieu, allowing for a better response. And indeed, um, they saw a, a, a high degree of response. They and others saw a high degree of response in FLT3 mutant patients who relapse after a stem cell transplant. And then they started to use it prophylactically uh, in people who had FLT3 AML who had a transplant. Uh, and they saw very few relapses. So that's uh, been the genesis of a large IBMT, our big, the big bone marrow transplant network trial comparing uh, in FLT3 mutant patients who've undergone a stem cell transplant, either placebo or no treatment, I can't remember which it is, versus uh, gilteritinib, which is that one of those new inhibitors. Um, Dr. Survey in Germany tried to add serafinib to chemotherapy in older adults, and that was a failure. Uh, it wasn't limited to FLT3 patients, but there was a lot of transplant -related mortality, uh, treatment related mortality when serafinib was added to chemotherapy in older adults. In younger adults, Dr. Rawlig from Germany uh, did a randomized phase two trial of chemotherapy alone plus or minus uh, serafinib. This was not restricted to FLT3 patients. All comers were allowed to go on. There was an event-free survival improvement for those who were randomized to serafinib. So again, this nonspecific inhibitor was doing something. Uh, it wasn't changing the overall survival, but the trial was not powered to really see that. There was an improved relapse-free survival in those and overall survival in those who had a mutation so maybe there was something there. So there was some hint that you could do something by adding a FLT3 inhibitor to uh, chemotherapy and AML. This was a trial that was done by uh, Jeff Wee uh, in the context of the alliance, used to be called CLGB. This is older adults with AML. They had to have FLT3 documented by a central lab. And if that older adult with AML had such a FLT3 mutation, they could get seven and three plus serafinib. This was not a randomized trial and go on to get intermediate dose ARC in consolidation with serafinib. So this was just compared to historical controls. And at least in patients who are between 60 and 70, the median survival was about uh, 19 months. And that was better than historical controls in the context of other older adult trials done by the Alliance slash CLGB. In people that were over age 70, well, they just didn't do that well. So there's a, you know, there were a few pieces of data that were somewhat encouraging with uh, chemo plus FLT3 inhibitors. Now I'm going to talk about uh, FLT3 inhibitors in, in the context of uh, mitostorin. Uh, and I showed you that data earlier about the, 20, uh, the, the trials we did with mitostorin as a single agent where we got some responses, nothing too great. We said, well, if it works in, as a single agent, we should combine it with uh, standard chemotherapy because standard chemotherapy has a big role in AML. And there were some preclinical studies which suggested that mitostorin, also called PKC-412, might be synergistic with chemotherapy. So uh, we combined mitostorin with chemotherapy in a uh, phase 1b trial done in all comers who were going to get chemotherapy. And this was done at uh, Dana-Farber and other centers around, uh, around the country and, and world. Um, relatively small trial. You can see there are about uh, 70 patients all told. Uh, and we had trouble combining it with uh, chemotherapy. Because if we gave it at 100 milligrams twice a day continuously, either with the chemotherapy or at the conclusion of the seven days of the induction, people threw up and wouldn't take it. So that was a no-go. Then we used the highest dose of the two doses tested, 100 milligrams, twice a day, uh, but just for 14 days, thinking that we could get people through it. But again, at that dose, it was too toxic. We finally dropped the dose to 50 milligrams twice a day and gave it for 14 days, either at the conclusion of the chemotherapy or with the chemo, the seven-day break, and then it again we saw that it could be tolerable. So we focused our response efforts on these 40 patients. And we found that uh, there was a pretty high CR rate in those who had FLT3 mutations. Again, it was a small number of patients, uh, but we were encouraged by that. We were also encouraged by the overall survival, which was equivalent. Again, all these patients had, uh, were exposed to the 
inhibitor. Uh, and some had wild type disease down here in the red, and about 13 had the mutation. The trial was just done to prove safety, but interestingly enough, when we went back and looked at the data, those who had the FLT3 ITD or TKD mutation were doing better than we expected. They were doing as well as were the other patients, suggesting maybe, although it was a very small trial, that we're actually doing something beneficial by adding the FLT3 uh, inhibitor to uh, chemotherapy. So that was the genesis. Uh, that that uh, trial was published in 2008 or 2009. And while it was being ready for publication, we launched uh, this very large uh, phase three randomized trial. Uh, the design was straightforward, although difficult to do logistically. So the idea here was that you, when you had AML, you walked into your doctor, whether it was in America, Canada, Germany, Italy, Spain, you uh, would have the doctor send an aliquot of your marrow or blood to a central lab in that particular country. In the U.S., the um, lab was in Ohio State. And you would be told within, 24, uh, within 48 hours whether or not your patient had a FLT3 mutation or not. So just imagine, I don't know how many people have taken care of AML, but you, they usually come in pretty sick, and people with FLT3 mutations tend to have high white counts. So you get this sick person with a high white count, you're waiting, 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 waiting for get them to give you the answer back whether this patient could go on the trial. And you can see most people were able to wait until we gave them the answer because we gave them the answer fairly quickly with drug company support to do that assay quickly. It's harder to do it uh, if you are waiting for uh, either a regular path lab or a commercial lab to do it. Anyway, um, then the patient would be randomized to standard of care, which was, and still probably is, uh, donorubicin cytarabine, followed by the high-dose ARC that Bob Mayer showed was effective in uh, younger adults with AML. Um, and then maintenance with either placebo down here or with a PKC. So they got 14 days of PKC during induction, 14 days of PKC or mitostorin during uh, each of the four post-remission cycles, and they got it for 12 months after that, unless something else occurred like a stem cell transplant. So the age was 18 to 60, actually age, age 18 to 59.99. Uh, they had to have non-APL AML, and again, they had to have the FLT3 mutation. They were allowed to get hydroxyurea, for up to five days while we were waiting to get the result back. Because it took about a day to get the sample to the lab, then 24 to 40 hours to get the answer back. So it may have been up to three day wait. And this was the standard therapy that we were using at the time. We still basically use this stuff. Uh, 60 milligrams per meter squared of donorubicin for three days, cytarabine continuously. The high dose ARC I mentioned that came from CLGB 8525, which was from Mayer et al. in 1994. And then this uh, maintenance. So what it really happened, we had to screen 3,300 patients to come out with 887 that had the FLT3 mutation. Now, if you're listening earlier, you know that that's about right. We expect about one-third of patients, maybe 30%, to have one of these two mutations. And then of the 887, we only randomized 717. You might ask, uh, where did the other 170 patients go who had a FLT3 mutation but didn't get randomized? I'll tell you, I don't know, because... Um, uh, we didn't collect that data. But it, presumptively, it was people who couldn't wait, may have died, may have gone to other trials. We don't really know. But of the 717 patients that were randomized, they were, of course, randomized equally to chemo plus placebo or chemo plus mitostorin. Uh, a couple of interesting things from the consort diagram that might be relevant when we talk about the final results was that the, um, a smaller number of patients who were randomized to mitostorin required two inductions as a poor man's assessment of how effective the therapy was. If you need more inductions, it's not as good. Uh, and a higher number of patients got to the maintenance, the 12 months of single agent therapy on the mitostorin arm compared to the placebo arm, maybe suggesting that there were more people who relapsed on the uh, mitostorin arm and uh, not on the, uh, more people who relapsed on the placebo arm. By the way, this is the only time when uh, in, the, in the last week where the red has lost compared to the blue, unfortunately. So um, it's good for this trial, though. It's good for the people AML, uh, because the people who were on mitostorin uh, did not had a... Uh, uh, first, they, they were equally likely to have either the type of FLT3 mutation, either the point mutation or a low allelic burden uh, ITD or a high allelic burden. And this was by design because this, the, the uh, trial was stratified according to this mutation, so this had to come out equally. One interesting thing was... Although the ages were balanced on the two trials, on the two arms, the, if you were ma a man, you were more likely to be randomized to mitostorin uh, 
And if you were a woman, you were more likely to be randomized to placebo, and that was actually statistically significantly different. That's shocking to me. Um, a seven, a seven, I should have learned something from this. Again, so that of 717 patients, what's the chance that the sex would be imbalanced? Not very likely. It's about the, I did the math, and it's about the same uh, likelihood as getting blackjack in, uh, in, uh, if you play, uh, you know, getting an ace in a, in a picture card in blackjack. Uh, so it can, can happen. It's not too likely. So uh, the complete response rate was a little bit higher if you randomized to mitostorin, 59% versus 53%. And if we were, but you had to, we had a very strict definition of CR. You had to get there by day 60. And uh, so that was, that's probably the reason for the low CR rate. If we relax the definition of complete remission to allow remissions a little bit later uh, in the course, 30 days from ending protocol therapy, um, it was statistically significantly better to have been randomized to the mitostorin arm, uh, reach complete remission. So that was suggesting we were maybe doing something good up front. Um, and the, in terms of event free survival, because the complete remission rate was low and not going into remission was an event, you'd have a big drop off at the beginning. But just looking at event free survival, or event being relapse, death, or no remission, um, you had an improvement had you been randomized to mitostorin, not, not censored for transplant, just censored for uh, end of follow up data. The primary endpoint of the trial was overall survival. And that's why this was probably presented at the plenary session last year of the American Society of Hematology because uh, it met its endpoint. Uh, one of the few uh, positive trials in AML in my memory, not in APL. So uh, if you were on mitostorin, you had a 23% reduced risk of death in the mitostorin arm compared to placebo. The, median, the medians are quite a bit different. You shouldn't even look at that, though. That's statistically a little bit wrong. But the median f survivals were different. But anyway, the point was there was an improvement in four-year overall survival. And this was regardless of whether the patients got transplanted or not. Now, during the course of this trial, which lasted between 2008 and 2011, the standard of care for FLT3 patients changed to basically try to do a transplant in first remission. So uh, on this trial, a full 56% of the patients got a transplant at some point along the way, and about a quarter of the patients got a transplant during first remission, which I would submit is now the standard of care uh, for FLT3 AML. So one would think, well, if you get a transplant in first remission, you were taken off the study after maybe induction and maybe one cycle of consolidation, something like that. So you weren't really exposed to mitostorin for very long. So that would have screwed up the whole study. Uh, but in point of fact, in, if you were transplanted in first remission, you did have a big benefit from mitostorin. And if you look at these survival curves, you can see that these are much better than what we saw originally. So if you can give somebody mitostorin and then get a transplant, you get a pretty good chance to be cured. And then we have this is a long follow-up here. So that's encouraging. So in summary, uh, mitostorin, which took a long time to come to roost, but this multi-targeted kinase inhibitor, which we thought was a FLT3 inhibitor, improves overall survival when added to standard chemotherapy uh, in FLT3 ITD and FLT3 mutant AML between 18 and 60. And the overall survival and event-free survival was consistent in uncensored as well as censored analysis, despite a high stem cell transplant rate, implying to me is that it had a major effect on the tumor burden going into transplant. I didn't have time to go over it, but the safety profile was similar in each arm, so it was not more toxic. And this uh, took a lot of effort between industry, academia. In the U.S., this trial was sponsored by uh, your tax dollars through Cancer Therapy Evaluation Program, and in other countries, uh, it was sponsored by Novartis. Uh, other investigators, actually some of uh, those who were on the mitostorin trial I just mentioned, uh, thought it was a good idea and did a phase two trial of adding mitostorin to standard chemotherapy uh, the difference here was they tried to transplant everybody since they recognized early on that was a good idea. And then they also wanted to give them the mitostorin after the transplant. Again, not randomized, but compared to historical controls, both in younger and older adults, it seemed to be better. So getting mitostorin, at least in two trials, was a good thing. Uh, one randomized, one non-randomized. So I think it really is going to be uh, the new standard of care for FLT3 uh, AML. But there's a lot of questions. Any good trial is going to... Uh, generated as many questions as went into it. Uh, for example, is this really about FLT3 inhibition? Would a potent FLT3 inhibitor versus a multi-targeted agent be better? So hopefully uh, your tax dollars will su uh, support a subsequent trial which will compare chemo plus mitostorin followed by transplant followed by mitostorin to chemo plus a novel, a newer specific agent like gilteritinib uh, followed by chemo plus gilteritinib followed by transplant followed by gilteritinib. So Try a non-specific FLT3 inhibitor versus a specific one and see what happens. So um, it's been a long journey. Uh, 
uh, to get to the point where we may have a new drug for this subtype of AML. Um, hopefully it won't take uh, as many years as it took to go from uh, science to reality uh, with this, but um, we need to look at other things like minimal residual disease. I have a lot of colleagues uh, at my place and around the world, including across the street, to thank for this, uh, for this work. So I'll be happy to take questions. Not FDA approved. Not yet. Mar oh, Novartis is working to get it improved right now. Putting yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Howard? Great presentation. Thank you so much. Um, you mentioned Mark Leverett's retrospective analysis of the plasma levels. In that trial, yes. Yeah, in his trial. If you had, and, um, you know, you mentioned some of the markers that, that now, uh, as I recall, NPM1, or is it NMP1? And PM1. Actually, it has been putatively a marker for better outcomes. It is indeed. So, so my, my question is, if you had to, with those kinds of knowledge in the background, if you had to do this trial, this program over again, do you think you would include like more population PK, seeking the, whether or not there ought to be like therapeutic adjustment? Right. There is, there is pop, there, there was, yeah, I didn't have time to present it. There is PK with this trial, which will be presented. And it seems to be, we do achieve an adequate level in most patients, unlike in Mark's trial. So that's good news. So this dose, it seems to be getting adequate levels in the plasma. I'm talking about with a new agent. Oh, I think it'd be great. Yeah, I think uh, it's very important to do those studies prospectively, absolutely. Because these are tricky drugs to, to, for the body to handle. Did you by NPM1 or do you? No, we didn't. But we're looking, uh, we're looking at NPM1 uh, status as well to throw that into the mix to see if that was predictive for uh, good result with mitostorin or not. So that's a, good, that's a great question, but we're looking at that right now. And were they all of the NMT3 mutate? No, we don't know that yet. Well, that was not, uh, the, we didn't do NGS sequencing prospectively, unfortunately, but there'll certainly be retrospective looks at that because many of the patients were at centers that routinely do that. But NPM1 uh, data will be available. Hi, Rich. Um, hey. Great Well, results. I didn't see you there, but I, this, uh, uh, Pam Cohen was one of the few people that remembers what it was like going to the FDA with this drug originally. Uh, yeah. Someday we'll talk about the, all the <laughs> twists and turns, but uh, thank you for your, your support in the early days of this uh, effort. Guerrilla warfare inside of pharma sometimes works, um, and I never tire of hearing the positive results, which were really um, heartwarming. So have you given some thought to why you think these data were positive when some of the other combination data, even in frontline, were not? And do you think specifically that that might have something to do with the intermittent nature where we tried to avoid giving the drug uh, I, you know, simultaneously with chemo? I think it, it could be because you're, there is some data from Don Small and Mark that suggests that if you do give the drug before chemo or perhaps with it, you do inhibit the ability of the chemotherapy to work by taking the cell to cell cycle. I also think the nonspecific nature of this inhibitor is probably important. Uh, as Levis says, the, uh, when you are present with AML, you have a more of a polyclonal disease uh, that you, than you do when you're, you know, when you relapse, you probably have more of a less, clonal, less polyclonal disease and maybe more FLT3 addicted. So um, maybe that's why it worked uh, where some of the specific inhibitors were. I actually think that specific inhibitors won't be any better than this drug for that reason when it, if they're tested. Rich, congratulations on, on persistence with, with a really tough project, uh, a difficult drug and, uh, you know, a very difficult disease to analyze. Yep. One of the things that occurs to me is that this is uh, one of a class of drugs, which are PKC inhibitors. And um, many years ago, PKC was inter of interest in the uh, sense that it would reverse multi-drug resistance exactly. uh, inhibition of PKC. So that could also be playing Absolutely. a role here, right? It's one of the other, yeah, that's how it was originally developed. And, yeah. uh, you know, it doesn't seem to have a big impact on the donorubicin levels, but yeah. it certainly could impact MDR and, MDR and perhaps get more of the stuff yeah. into the cells. Yeah. 